I don't know if people familiar with that really um, that Greek myth of Icarus and Icarus was uh, obviously um, imprisoned in the labyrinth with his father his father builds you know wax wings so they can escape or wax stuck together feathered um, wings and they fly to get out of the labyrinth and the father says to Icarus be careful you don't fly too high because the sun will melt the wax of your wings and you will um, crash to your death and of course Icarus does um, he flies high and he gets very excited and loves it and doesn't realize his wax is melting and he crashes now that in many ways is a spirited version of life spirit is always thought about as up and you could argue that our culture is consumed with spirit energy and the myth of going up and symbol symbolized most obviously by our love of very tall buildings and great industrial development is symbolized by the tallest buildings in the world um, by big by high, by our ability to do things through technology and escape our bodies and our mortality and escape the realities of ecological limits. And I guess soul is metaphorically a way of saying, well, let's think about not energy going up, but energy that's taking us down, that's more grounded, that's more earthy, that's uh, more rooted in the limits of the ecological world we live in. I, I've kind of been moving towards the idea of soul because soul for me metaphorically enters this, it pulls us, invites us to a space of imagination, of desire. It's that poetic world of desire and imagination. Now, this is where energy is created in the world of imagination and desire. Most of us get active, not because we think it's a good thing to do in the sense of the word think. It's because something in our imaginative world gets unlocked that we, and we, we, energy is generated within us. So I'm suggesting that if we're committed to social change, we also have to tap into that realm of desire and imagination. And it's not going to come out of just the world of thought and volition, it's going to come out of the world of imagination. So the notion of soul then is saying, how do we tap into the imaginative energies of people that want to be involved in social change? How do we really generate those energies? Because I don't think the traditional social and political sciences do that. They won't unlock that kind of energy. Soul, as an idea, indicates depth. Uh, it's sort of the energy that we I'm, I'm calling for to go down rather than up. Um, so to be a bit more grounded, to be a bit slower, to be a bit more careful, to be more conscious of the ecological limits in our world. Soul invites mindfulness in the work. And what mindfulness does, if nothing else, it says, how do we be present to what is going on right now? Soul attempts to turn an event into an experience. So we really experience it. So if you're in a community meeting, a lot of us are, would be focused on how, what are we doing? What's our achievements? What are our goals? What are our tactics? And I'm saying it's all very well. That's very, that's spirited. Okay. And we need that. We need the vision. We need the strategy. But it's kind of out of balance. And so soul says, well, how are we also going to be together? Um, and in fact, it, it says something a bit more. It says that maybe in a world that's going so fast, that's so focused on activity and efficiency, the best way to change the world is to change how we be with one another and slow it all down, uh, be more human together, 
focus on that community element of community development. And if we do that well, we will be changing the world. Again, it's depth, so it's similar to soul, but a soulful, soulful perspective really says, or what I'm trying to communicate, is that there's a lot of stuff happening at a subtle subterranean level, and we often don't have eyes to see it. So for example, you know, when we think of the economy, we see what's obvious, uh, big businesses at work, people exchanging, labor for salaries, um, income. Now we think of that as the economy. Okay, it's not. It's the obvious, clear, visible part of the economy. The economy includes what's happening at a very subtle subterranean level, which is often people doing work as volunteers, women and increasingly men doing home labor work, looking after children or domestic work. We're seeing a lot of economic activity that could be located in the gift economy where people are gifting each other, exchanging their labor. Um, so, so this is happening at a subterranean, subtle level. We don't see it because it's not broadcast. So for a star, a soulful perspective says, what's happening at this soulful uh, sub subterranean level? So, and, and it starts to tap into that. It, it, gives attention to it. We often are not attentive to the subterranean energies going on, going on within community processes. It's about the fact that in Western culture, you know, post 16th century, we've disenchanted the world. We're, we're moving in many ways towards a secularist world view. And, and even though religion has a huge role even in so-called secular societies. Our, our development vision is informed by a secular vision and the language in particular of capital and resources, we talk about you know, natural resources, natural capital, human capital, human resources. Um, the objects of development, people, the ground, earth, you know, are, are viewed as objects that can help humans develop themselves economically. Now this is the heart of the industrial view and it, it, it's deeply connected to a disenchanted view of the world. So in highlighted the problem, you know, the industrial version of development, we move towards this, the indigenous vision of development. And as I've said much earlier, a lot of collective action around the world is being energized by the indigenous model of development or Western people that are learning, relearning from the indigenous model. Um, and I guess at a fundamental level, what the indigenous model of development, call it a model, is teaching us is how do we rethink our relationship, not just to one another, i.e. human community, but to other elements of the cosmos, the earth, the planet. Um, and we, we, so we have disenchanted the world. We see these things, the world, the planet as resources. The word ensouling, kind of reanimating the world, ensoul, animate, it's, it's a way of thinking about us rediscovering the interconnectivity or interconnections we have with objects, trees, earth, soil, country. We enter again into a, a reciprocal, mutual, dialogical relationship with the planet uh, where we see country as the, our indigenous people in Australia call it, um, not as an object to be exploited in extractive industries, but as uh, a living part of our lives that we give and take from and we relate to and care for. And souling is a way of thinking about community development in this ecological model that's refocusing the interconnectivity 
the system's way of thinking about the world we live in. And that has huge implications then for the way we think about development and our work. Soul force, at a very simple level, refers to Gandhi's, Mahatma Gandhi's notion of satagaya, which was best translated as soul force into English, which referred to his notion of really non-violent action you know, against power, um, and powerful interests. Now, I guess, that, you know, so we think of it as nonviolent civil disobedience, nonviolent social action, but it's like, well, what, what's the word soul got to do with this? And I guess what, I, what I, I'm trying to allude to again is that soul force really in our contemporary era, I think, says, how do we be careful not to be caught up in fast-moving, technologically driven distraction such that we fail to get in touch with deep core values, deep core emotions that will fuel sustained, courageous action around an issue. Um, and, and, and I think, I mean, a good mentor once said to me, you know, Peter, the big challenge in life if you want to be involved in social change is to pick the issue that you're going to focus on in your life and really give your life to it. You know, don't get involved in 20 things and do nothing. Um, and if you deeply meditate um, on the one issue and get involved in the one issue, over many years you'll discover two things. One, how intractable the the resistant regimes or powerful forces are that don't want change in that area. Call it refugee issues, environmental issues, economic justice issues. You, know, you realize that to bring change around one of those issues re requires deep, long-term sustained action. It's not going to be one march, you know, one get-up signature. It's going to require the long haul. Um, two, it, you eventually learn over the long haul that one of the big challenges is changing yourself. That it's all very well to be for environmental justice, but how do you live? And it's only if you kind of find the courage and the depth, soul force, to kind of go the distance on an issue and go deep into yourself that I think we will see a real change. The current challenge is that I think People are, technology defines us in many ways. Um, and, and we are now so caught up in a fast moving web of technology that we're distracted by endless issues and concerns. And that, that is a sure way not to get in touch with soul force, being deep emotional value driven change.